I invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 8. And as you turn there, um, just this, these announcements here. Let me turn this up a little, Preston. The, uh, this Love the Bible, guys, take that opportunity to invite people. Um, this Love the Bible and Change Africa and also for Easter. Partake in the ministry and one of the ways you can do that is get people to church in a setting where the people of God are worshiping God, hearing the word of God. Romans 8, 28, and we know all things work together for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. <clears throat> we left off on this verse and uh, we know that God can turn those things um, that the enemy meant for evil, as the song says, and turn them into good. But we must love God through the process. Um, another reminder in Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter two, Paul is writing them and he tells them, remember, and he talked about the doctrine of the rapture, they were worried, they were panicking, they thought they missed it, all these things were going through them, and he said, remember I told you these things when I was with you? And we have a deep propensity, a, a, a drawing to forget about the truth of God and to forget about the love of God, which um, is gonna be the rest of the chapter. And if I were to title this sermon is Don't Forget About God's Love. Because we do, we do because of pride, we do because of worry, we do because of uh, trials and distresses in our lives, just like the Thessalonians, and Paul is reminding them of his word. He's saying, hey, remember I spoke these things to you. You don't have to worry about if the Lord is gonna receive you, if he's gonna come back for you, and if he loves you, he is with you always. And the rest of this chapter is that incredible encouragement. He says in verse 29, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. <clears throat> Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Whom shall bring a charge against God's elect? Is it God who justifies? Who is it who condemns? Is it Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sakes we are killed all day long. For the slaughter... Yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That, ladies and gentlemen, is an amen moment. That is a hallelujah. This is an amazing portion of scripture. This is a scripture that we should use as spiritual medicine. We have to go to the doctor a lot. We get pills a lot. By the way, has anybody ever taken those H. pylori antibiotics? They're like horse tranquilizers. They're like that big of a pill and it makes you feel like you're on chemotherapy. This is a portion of scripture that we should take on a regular basis. 
as a spiritual pill, just says, Lord, I need this today. And, and, and understand this context before we get into the beginning of this predestination thing. The context is these people's religious assumptions, moral righteousness have been destroyed by truth for seven chapters. He goes into chapter one and he, he's saying that humanity, they are rejecting the very moral consciousness within them. They're rejecting the evidence of creation, yes, outside in the world, but also inside and especially inside humanity. That's what Romans 1 says, especially what, was, what, what is in them. We are, we are connected to God because we're in his image. Even unbelievers are connected to God, not through salvation or reconciliation, but being in his image. We are uniquely made. And because of this rejection, this is what happens when an individual throws out God out of his life. This is what happens when a family throws God out of the family. This is what happens when a nation throws God out of a nation or a school throws God out of a school. And I want to say something. The moment that a school starts teaching Darwinism as a Darwinian evolution as a scientific fact has thrown God out of the school. And, and when these things happen, Romans 1 teaches us that humanity starts behaving like animals. Isn't that an interesting? The Bible isn't too flattering when it, truth destroys our assumptions, our false assumptions. It destroys them. And the truth that is being spoken here has destroyed their religious assumptions. You guys, America alone, and I don't know the numbers in Kenya yet, somebody should, should find out, has killed over 50 million babies, murdered them, ripping them to pieces in their mother's womb. It's the biggest genocide the world has ever seen, other than the flood just like animals, like animals legalizing, and Kenya also legalized abortion through uh, the uh, most modern constitution, giving doctors discretion. You just turned abortion into a racket of profiteering in Kenya, and that's exactly what happened. Animal-like, completely destroyed. And it'll go on in Romans 1 talking about sodomy, men with men, women with women. And there are churches that are, that are ordaining homosexual men, lesbian women. Animal-like. And he destroys, he says... Guys, you see what happens when you don't have God and then when you try to bring a false God in your life by earning salvation, you have to understand that none of our works are good enough to be right with God, good enough to justify us, good enough to bring salvation, good enough to give us an eternal hope in heaven. None of it is good enough. And what Paul is doing here in chapter eight, as he's closing a section, because the first part of the book of Romans was the wrath of God, the second part was the grace of God, this third part is the will of God. And understand the will of God for our lives today is to get us to understand we have to stop looking at our works and start looking at the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Because there are a lot of us who are on this roller coaster ride, ladies and gentlemen, of legalism. Legalism and a wrong view of grace, just up and down, up and down, up and down. And we're looking at our works, and the moment that we feel righteous, we feel close to God. It's a terrible thing. The moment that we feel unrighteous, we feel separated from God. And the, the word of God is trying to clear this up. So they're sitting there like, okay, 
We can't save ourselves. And do you know what the real problem is? It's, it's okay. the, the question arises, and Paul is addressing this, and he's saying, it's not up to you. You're not in control of the situation. And do you know why we hate that? Because we want to be in control of the situation. Human beings are the most controlling. I, guys, it's amazing. The husband wants to control the wife. The wife wants to control the husband. The parents want to control the children. The children want to control the parents. We just, everyone wants to control each other. Isn't it amazing that a little child can start controlling the situation? They can be two years old and start telling everyone in the room what to do. Adults. It's like, you, you, <laughs> it's amazing to me. I have to tell my children, especially, I, I won't embarrass them, but a couple of them. If you guys knew how many times my wife is in the back of the room going, no, no, stop it. <laughs> I said I wasn't going to name them, but they're girls. And I, I, I've had to tell them, you don't get to control the situation. They even want friends just so they can control other people. They Oh, we're friends, okay. This is what you're going to do when you come to my house. We're going to have a tea party at 9 o'clock. At 10 o'clock, you're going to sit down and listen to me talk. And the whole day is planned. And, and God comes along and he says, you're not in control. And by the way, that's a good thing because if you were, you would be in big trouble. And that's what's going on here. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What is the purpose of this predestination, of this glorification, of this justification, of this calling? It is to be conformed to the image of God. He wants to lift us out of the depressing sin in our lives and to set our feet on solid ground where we can walk in holiness, righteousness, and peace and joy. And, and he goes on, it's called the royal chain of redemption or the glory road of redemption, as theologians will call it, and, and who he foreknew he also predestined. Can I clear something up? When Paul was writing this, there was no John Calvin. There was no John Arminian. There was no Reformed theology and Arminian theology and Wesleyan theology and Catholic theology and, 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 and all of these things, Anabaptist theology, and there's 20 more that I could name. There was none of that. You know what there was? There was an early church, the foundation of Christianity, and these Christians are in pain, and they're hurting, and they're suffering. And they're doubting because of their pain and their hurt and their suffering. They're doubting. And they're saying, okay, well, we're not in control. That's a problem because I like to be in control. We can't earn favor with God. Okay, Paul, this is actually good news. You, you, you're telling me that we don't have to earn favor with God because God already loves us. God already died for us. All of us have favor, not just the so-called prophets in Africa. You know, not just the so-called apostles or the pastors. Everybody in this room has favor with God because Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. And, and, and we have to remember that. We elevate man, and man, because they're elevated in our eyes, are blocking Jesus Christ, our vision. You guys ever done the finger trick? If you look at your finger, you only see your finger. If you look past, it, it's, it looks like your finger is almost transparent. You can see right through it. Ever done that? No? Okay. You got to look past what's going on in the world and look to Jesus and the world immediately seems invisible. And... and that, that's what's happening here. He's, he's saying, guys, you don't have to worry about it. I know you're suffering. 
I, I, know, I know that you're going through persecution. I know you're going through financial difficulties. I know you're struggling, but, and you want to take control of the situation, but it's better that you don't because you are not the initiator of all of this that I have done. I am. I'm in control. That's what he's trying to say, that he is the author of salvation, that he chose us before the foundations of the world, that he justified us just as if I'd never sinned. Justification means he's cleansed us from sin. That's what he's done. This is good news. This isn't supposed to cause the church to debate for 2,000 years whether Calvin or John Armenian was right. This is supposed to encourage us that in our doubt, because we are not the initiators of our faith and salvation, that we should put all of our trust and all of our faith and all of our hope in the initiator of salvation who chose his church and chose you before the foundations of the world. That's what's going on here. It's an encouragement. And we turned it into a debate. We turned it into fighting for 2,000 years. Isn't it amazing that one of the greatest scriptures most supposed to encourage the body of Christ is the very scripture that the body of Christ has used to debate for 2,000 years? That's how messed up we are. No, 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 you, you're suffering, yes. Your religious assumptions have been destroyed. You can't control your salvation. You can't earn your salvation. Now you're wondering because you've had the revelation of how sinful you are, whether God is going to continue to love you. And here's the good news. He will continue to love you. He chose us. He predestined us. He called us. He justified us. And he glorified. The word glorified means he lifted us up. And then in verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, see, that's the point of this passage. God is for us. He's in control. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Not some things, not one thing, not a hundred thousand things, all things. It, it, it amazes to me, it amazes me that the revelation of God's love that has been so demonstrated through Jesus Christ, so talked about through the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, and the whole point of these chapters in the book of Romans is stop looking at yourself, look at Christ, and the moment that we look at Christ for, for one moment, it's like, yes, I, I believe. You're right, the evidence is all around us. Man man can't save themselves, we're lost. And the moment that we look at him for a second and we get born again, no sooner than we look at him for salvation, we look right back to ourselves for sanctification. We look right back to ourselves to find hope. Why? Because we have an insatiable desire every single day to take control of our lives. And we have to let it go. And we're sitting there, we're at times like, oh, Lord, can you bless me with this or with this? And sometimes we ask for things that God's not going to give us because we ask for stupid things. But sometimes we're like, Lord, can you, we need food. Guys, you're asking God for food and he gave you Jesus Christ? Imagine, can you bring up the first picture Imagine you go into a jewel store, a diamond store. Do we have a picture here? Look at that diamond, guys. Isn't that a beautiful diamond? It's called a pink diamond. If I were to ask you how much you thought that was worth, you wouldn't even be able to tell me, I guarantee it. Anybody want to shout out a number? I just told you you wouldn't be able to, so I guess you don't want to. 
These pink diamonds, one of these pink diamonds in the world is worth $72 million. It's billions of shillings. I do the math, but I don't have my phone with me. I can't do 72 million times 130 right now. Can you imagine going in a jeweler store and you're with your wife, you want to buy her a diamond? There's no way that anyone, there's probably only 1% of the world that can afford this. And we can't afford it. And the guy says, you know what? I actually love you guys. And I see that you love each other. I have this diamond. It's worth a lot of money. You can't afford it, but I'm going to give it to you. Here's your diamond. Can you imagine if in receiving that diamond, we had an insulting question like, oh, thank you so much. I know this is probably ridiculous. And you can say no if you want to, but can I go to the bathroom and borrow some toilet paper to wrap the diamond up in? Would that be offensive or or not? That toilet paper is worth a few shillings. I don't want all of it. I don't want all the toilet paper. Can I just have two squares, please? And how do you think God feels when he's already given his son and he wants to bless you with all good things and we're begging for the worst things? Not knowing that sometimes when we beg for those things that he knows he wants to give us, there's something right around the corner to bite us. Next picture. That that was the cue, guys. You missed my cue. This is really, have nothing to do with the sermon other than watch for spiders next time you're... When I was looking for images of toilet paper, this came up and I wanted you to see it today. Some of you ladies are never going to look at toilet paper the same way in the bathrooms. Okay, you can take the picture down. No, but really, God has given us the best thing. We ask for things lesser, and because our focus is on those things, we get bitten and poisoned by the world. And guys, he's given us his son. Yes, he wants to give you food. He, he's given a son. He wants your family to be blessed. He works all things for the good for those who love him and are called to his purpose. We need to start praying for things that we know God has made available to us. I mean, one of the hallmarks of Calvary Chapels, and our Calvary Chapel is is no different, is that, guys, we love people, and we actually love people. We show it. You're a single mother. We love you. We, we, we don't, we don't got to judge you for your past. You've had abortions. We love you. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You, uh, you were, you, you know, we, you were yelled at at one particular church or made fun of because you were wearing trousers as a woman. You can wear trousers here anytime. I remember a lady came to our church years ago. She was at Moy University. She said that she went into a Christian union meeting and right when she walked in, you know, she was wearing trousers. And I don't know if this is starting to leave the church, but she stopped her sermon. She says, that we know that the devil has come into the church today because women are wearing trousers in the church. Can you imagine how humiliating it would have been for that girl? No wonder an entire young generation in Kenya has rejected Christianity because of all these rules, regulations, and laws that have nothing to do with you earning the love of Jesus Christ or being right with him. They have no idea what the Bible says about women and men's clothing. They have no idea about the historical context of tattooing yourself like the other nations and worshiping their gods. They, 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 they don't know this. They have these religious things going on and it is preventing people from seeing the love that Jesus Christ has for them. And pastors are wondering, by the way, they're wondering. They're saying, why are people going to Calvary Chapel Eldoret? Why are people going there? 
Well, because we offer forgiveness of sins freely without telling them to change their pants or trousers. Does pants still mean underwear? I'm trying to, does it? But you know what I'm saying. Now, we really don't want you to wear your underwear at church. But if you do, we'll still love you. And you see all these things. Well, why are people going to the church? Because we help people. We don't kick people out when they get pregnant. We don't do that here. It breaks my heart that people and leaders and ministers around the world are misrepresenting Jesus Christ. Romans 8 wants us to see, guys, that he gave his son He gave his son. He wants to bless you. He wants to give you joy and peace. He wants you to be filled with this joy and peace so that you can have such assurance in him that you never have to look to yourself to feel loved by him. So, verse 33, who shall bring a charge against you? God's elect. Is it God who justifies? Who is it who condemns? Is it Christ who died and furthermore is also risen? Who is even at the right hand of God making intercession for you? So so it's like, okay, you don't think God is thinking about you because you've sinned recently? You don't think God is thinking about you because you have doubts? Oh, if I'm righteous for a couple weeks, then I'll have favor. And you have a whole world of ministers, a whole world of false prophets and false apostles and bad pastors that are trying to tell you this is how you earn favor from God. You do this and you do that and you do this and you do that and you do this. And the word of God is saying, who is it that condemns you? There are three major enemies to our souls, the world, the, uh, the Satan and the uh, demons, and the flesh. Which one of those conditions? Is it people in the world? Is it a religious system that you grew up in that condemns you? You have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this to get favor. Tenfold blessings, seed offerings, you know, do this. Oh, the reason your prayers aren't being answered is because you didn't give money to the pastor. Oh, um, the reason that the reason that you're not blessed, the reason that you're cursed because your family has a witch doctor that has curses on you, and you're and, and guys, even some of us in this room believe such lies from the world. Oh, I have people come up and they say, "Hey, my dad has three wives." My mom is the third wife, and the first wife casts spells on me with a witch doctor, so I'm cursed, and I'm not getting school fees, and I'm always sick. Do you know how many times people have said that to me at this church? And I have to take him to Galatians 2, that there's no curses for his people, that he, Jesus Christ, became a curse for us because cursed is every man who hangs on the tree and the moment that Jesus died on the cross broke every single curse for anybody who would believe on him? You know how many times I've had to tell that to people? That weird witch doctor in your village has no power over you. Who is it that condemns you? Christ is asking the rhetorical question. Nobody can condemn you because he has loved you and sacrificed himself for you. Witch doctor. Guys, you could bring 400 witch doctors in this room. You could put me in the middle and they could start their little, yeah, 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 whatever they do. They don't do that, do they? Sorry, yeah, yeah, what is that? They can do whatever they want. They can cut animals. They can draw blood. And, and, and they can do what they want towards me. And it would not cause me to fret for one second. And the moment that I speak the gospel to them and resist them in Jesus' name, they have to flee. 
They have no power over you. Who is it that condemns you? Who is it? Nobody. The world can't condemn you. Satan can't condemn you. And worst of all, worse than the other two, they're worse, by the way, is your flesh. You're still trying to take control of your salvation. Trying to take control of, to, to have your own strength and sanctification. Jesus Christ is encouraging us this morning, ladies and gentlemen. He's saying, who is it to condemn you? Are you condemning yourself? How dare you? How dare you condemn yourself? God loves you. He died on the cross for you. You ought not to do that. It's God who died. It's God who justifies. It's Christ who died. And furthermore, is also risen. We can rise to new life in Christ. Who is even at the right hand of God who makes intercession for us? Okay, I get it. Then he loves me. He died on me. I'm not condemned. I'm going to heaven. I believe it. But he's really mad at me. He doesn't think of me. He doesn't have thoughts about me. And then it says here that not only did he die, not only did he rise, not only do you not have to be condemned, you can let go of the control of your life and give it to God but also he's praying for you every day, every time he thinks of you. You guys, do you know how amazing it is when people come up to us and say, hey, I was thinking about you this week. I was praying for you. I was asking, how are you doing? I would encourage you, develop this habit really quick to think of other people. Legitimately, be genuine. Don't say you're gonna pray for somebody and don't pray for somebody. We all do that, don't we? I'll be praying for you. Guys, if we actually prayed for everybody we said we're going to pray for, we would have a prayer list the size of Mount uh, not Mount Rushmore, you don't know, Mount Everest, Mount Kilimanjaro. No, actually pray for people, talk to them, and say, hey, I'm thinking of you. I'm praying for you. How's that situation going? I heard something happen in your family. What's going on? Do you, guys, that encourages us, doesn't it? And Jesus Christ does the same thing. He says, hey, I'm thinking of you. I love you. I know you feel condemned. You should not. That's not good. And not only did I die for you, not only did I raise, rise again from the dead, I, and yes, I'm at the right hand of the Father, but I'm praying for you every day. I'm praying for you every day. The thoughts that I have towards you, they're good. The thoughts of love and peace and joy. So he goes on, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as a sheep for the slaughter. Do you see how completely descriptive and exhaustive the word of God is? God knows what we're thinking. If, if you've ever tried to, I have a weird habit where I like to try to tell somebody, uh, not in a counseling session, because that can be rude, but you're just hanging out with your friends and you tell them what you're thinking. Well, I know, tell them what they're thinking. And if you ever like get what their thoughts are right, they think you're a prophet or something. They're, oh. It's interesting. Yesterday, I, I t there was um, something in somebody's hand that I couldn't see. And it's just a total guess. It's like, this is what you have in your hand. It's the very thing that they had in their hand. They got on their knees and started worshiping. No, I'm just kidding. They did you know, I get it right like once every two years. <laughs> I get it wrong almost every time. God never gets it wrong. He knows the progression of thought. So here's what's going on. Okay, we see the truth of Romans 1 through 7. Man can't save themselves. They're sinful. They've separated themselves by becoming like animals because they kicked God out of their minds and their hearts. Jesus Christ still loves us, so he died for us. He's on the cross. Okay, you're telling me he loves me and I don't have to be condemned. That's fine. 
but we're struggling here. We have famine and we have sword and we have persecution and we have distress and we have peril. And and, and Jesus Christ is gone. Well, that's nice. He's up in heaven thinking of us and praying for us and that blesses us. But who is here? What's happening? Well, is he still with us? And, and what's the evidence? Okay, so he died on the cross. Is he going to continue to sacrifice for us? Is he going to continue to love us? And Paul says, hey, for your sakes, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep amongst us uh, for the slaughter. Paul's saying, we have evangelists, we have apostles, we have pastors, we have missionaries. Paul's a missionary, by the way. And he goes out into the world. They go out into the world. Stephen, Paul, James, Peter, they're going out and they're spreading the love of Jesus Christ and they're being killed for it. So Paul's like, I know the Holy Spirit can read your mind. The Holy Spirit knows what you're thinking and you're still doubting. And after believing all the things we've just said, you're still doubting. And let me tell you something. Don't doubt because, yes, Jesus Christ is making intercession for us. And he's up in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Though the Holy Spirit's in us, the Holy Spirit is calling many to go out to die so that you can still receive the love of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible's saying. You guys know why we have this today? Because God supernaturally ordained that men and women would lose their lives in order to translate the word of God perfectly into modern languages. They died. They shed their blood. Blood shed. Not the blood of atonement like Christ, but blood of sacrifice because these men went out. These women went out and they died. You don't think God still loves you? People are still dying for their faith today. And listen, Paul's like, we're dying. Paul would have his head severed off. And then he says, yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So you have a guy like the Apostle Paul. You have Stephen, who was stoned to death when Saul of Tarshish was holding his jacket so that, uh, excuse me, holding the jackets of all the people that needed to stone Stephen. You know, you guys ever played sports in a jacket or a really tight shirt? You have to take the jacket off, right? So these guys, they're ready to stone Stephen. They're taking their jackets off. They go over to a man named Saul and they put it on him and they kill Stephen throwing stones at his head and face. Kill shots were the big achievements of a stoning. Hit them in the head and they'll die quicker. And the apostle Paul, who was Saul of Tarshish, is holding these things. Don't you think that those who are murdering somebody by using their physical power to do so should actually be the ones that say they are more than conquerors? You got Stephen there, preaches one of the best messages in the New Testament. Amazing. He, he, he's like this amazing preacher. He preaches and he does such a wonderful job anointed by the Holy Spirit that the religious leaders don't even have words. They get so angry because they're cut to the heart that they gnash with their teeth. You guys know, you know who gnashes with their teeth in our, in our society? Madmen on the streets going... <laughs> Crazy people who've lost their minds. That's what the religious leaders were reduced to through the preaching of Stephen. And they have the power to kill him. And Paul, do you ever think he goes back and think, thought about, I thought I was a conqueror then. I was arresting Christians. We were stoning them. We were throwing them into prison and killing them. And now Paul is on the other side of this. And he is actually going to be murdered, be killed, 
losing his head. His head is going to be chopped off. He even says in Romans 8, what we just read, that we are dying so that because Christ loves you, we're dying because Christ loves you. And guess who are the conquerors? Not the people killing us. The ones who are dying are the conquerors. You know why? Were the Romans successful? Were the Jews and religious leaders successful in stopping the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the world? No. That was their mission. That's why they conquered. In fact, their persecution only accelerated the spread of the gospel. I think it's an amazing thing what Paul says here. And he says, we're we're the conquerors. And not just him, guys. Us. Those of us who are believers, we're the conquerors. Not the people with the multi-millions of shillings. Not the government who was stealing billions of shillings from the Kenyan people. They're not the conquerors. We are. And he goes on, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Have you sinned recently? God still loves you. Are you having troubles financially? God still loves you. Not even angels can separate you from the love of God. In fact, the list that we just got here in the last portion of scripture we have today is an exhaustive list. There is nothing else to mention. Nothing can separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. Guys, this message, this portion of scripture, it's encouraging. And I would encourage you that if you think you're in control of your life, of your salvation, of your sanctification, of anything, you're not. And you need to stop trying to take control and you need to give it over to God knowing that there's nothing that you have ever done that would cause you to be separated from the love of Jesus Christ. Yes, he wants you to stop sinning, but that's another message for another day. Stop treating forgiveness as something to be earned, but something to be received because your sin can never be greater than his sacrifice. Let's bow our heads in prayer as the worship team comes out. If you're not born again, I would encourage you to be born again today. Maybe you've had a wrong view of God. Maybe you thought he was this angry God in heaven who is ready to destroy you for your sin not realizing that he sacrificed his own son so that you can be forgiven for your sin so that you wouldn't have to be judged so that you wouldn't have to be sacrificed so that you wouldn't have to be killed Father, I ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit, please, upon everyone here in this room. And Lord, that you would help us to see you clearly. As we've read your word, we can get a a clearer picture of who you are because of what you've done and what you continue to do and also what you continue to do through your people. Please help us, Lord. I want to invite anybody who is not walking with the Lord, who is not born again, who maybe has had a bad religious experience, not knowing the true and living God, Jesus Christ, our King. I want to pray for you in just a moment. I want to ask you to raise your hand in just a moment to receive this prayer in order that you may receive Jesus Christ and begin a fresh or a new relationship with him today. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And having heard the reading of scripture today, know that there's nothing that has ever separated you from the love of Jesus Christ. So if you want to receive prayer today, to come back to him or 
be born again, just raise your hand right now where you're sitting. I'll pray for you before we leave. Raise your hand and I'm going to pray for you right now. Anyone? Raise your hand and we'll pray for you. Receive Jesus Christ. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Don't walk away if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. Lord, I pray for all these raising their hand right now. Thank you for touching their hearts. Thank you that your word has spoken to them and maybe even displaced lies that they've believed in their hearts, maybe even because of a religious system or church that has misrepresented you. Lord, please pour out your spirit upon them. As your spirit speaks to them, how much you love them. There's nothing that they have done that can separate them from your love. Help them, Lord. Save them and bless them. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody says amen. And please keep your hands raised so we can recognize you guys. Look at them here. Give them a hand. God bless you. Guys, if you've raised your hand, please go to the Connect station, fill out. Uh, a new believer and we want to call you we want to pray for you we want to give you a bible if you want to talk myself and some of the ministers and prayer team will be in front of the stage after the service the Lord loves us I think the greatest thing that we could ever see the, the greatest thing that we could ever experience in our lives is is knowing God, knowing his nature. And when it comes to his children, he does not cast us away. And we got to stop trying to earn this favor with God. We just got to walk in the favor that he's already given us. And guys, wouldn't you say it's favor that somebody came from heaven and bled out every drop of blood on the cross for you? Don't you call that favor? He loves you. And you go spread this message to this city. And you say, we're at a church where we're receiving the word of God, a word that is not condemning his children, but lifting them up, calling them out, and glorifying them and blessing their lives. You go spread this message. And let me tell you something. You are the ministers of this church. You are. And I believe God is bringing a revival to Eldoret. I believe that. Not just because I'm hoping, but because I'm witnessing God change so many people's lives. One of our favorite songs we haven't sung in a while, we're going to sing right now. Would you stand as I invite the ushers and deacons to receive today's offering? Let's pray for the offering. Lord, please grant us wisdom in the administration of these gifts that you may be glorified and that your kingdom may be spread. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with us as we pray.